This is episode 92 of Extraordinary Women Radio. Welcome to Extraordinary Women Radio. I am your host, Cami Gilmer. Women are being called to lead with voice, vitality, and vigor. Each week, join me for wisdom-filled interviews with extraordinary women living out loud and making a difference in our world. Their stories will uplift, inspire, and spark your own purpose-driven journey. Hello, my extraordinary women friends. Well, it is a balmy 12 degrees here in Colorado today. And so it was so much fun to imagine myself in Africa with today's guest, Carla Geyser, where it is 86 degrees. I wish I could just magically zip myself around the world to join her in this moment. I love to travel and I've been to some pretty amazing places in our world from Tibet to Patagonia in South America and across Europe but I have not been to Africa, at least yet. And after this interview today, I can't wait to go. It's been one of my top places I want to visit for some time, so I'm not sure why I haven't made it there yet, but certainly it's going to be soon because this one really speaks to me. Our guest, Carla Geyser, is an adventurer. She is a humanitarian and eco-warrior and is the founder of MPO Blue Sky Society Trust which is an organization that leads all female expeditions into Africa to raise money and awareness for conservation groups. Carla believes that one person can make a difference to protect, preserve, and improve life for people, wildlife, and communities in need. And she wants to be that person. She is involved in many social upliftment and conservation awareness projects across Africa. In 2016, Carla led South Africa's first all-women expedition to Kenya, and more recently, a second all-female expedition called the Rise of the Matriarch in 2018. She's creating experiences that has women falling in love with Africa, connecting to nature and to the community, and helping them slow down at this time, at the same time bringing more awareness to important conservation issues associated with the wildlife of Africa. Carla's passion is inspiring. Her tenacity is powerful. I can't wait to share her stories with you. Let's dive in and meet Carla Geyser. Well, welcome to Extraordinary Women Radio, Carla. I'm so excited to have you today. Thank you so much, Kimmy. It's a a great honor being online with you. Oh, that's a great honor to be online with you as well. I'm really thankful and grateful to our dear friend, Tommy Wolf, who introduced us. Yes, uh, Tommy was came on my recent, uh, one, of, well, one of my latest uh, expeditions last year. She was an incredible crew member to have on board. And uh, you spend lots of hours on the, the road and you get to talk um, about things. And she was uh, a good teacher and inspiration for me as well. Yeah, she's so she's a good, good teacher. Yeah, she's a great teacher and inspiration to me as well. So I think that... Uh, it, it was an exciting time for her, and I know it was. A, she told me it was a life changing event that she as she went on that trip with you. So I oh, know shame, and I miss her so much. I promise you, when you you're literally living in each other's pockets for two weeks, and then suddenly they've gone, and there's often you find yourself turning around to tell them something, and they're not there. So right, <laughs> you have separation anxiety. I think exactly, exactly. <laughs> I can totally appreciate that. When I re- lead retreats, yeah. I feel the same way when my my retreat people leave, and so it's. Um, and, it, and, and this was really an extended time frame, so I can I really appreciate that. Okay, yeah. So where and where are you calling from in Africa today? I know you're in Africa. It's it's six thirty yes. at night. Um, tell us a little bit about what your day's been like and where you're calling from. Okay, I've had a beautiful day. It's I'm sitting here in Cape Town, the mother city. Um, if I look off to my left hand side, I've got the most magnificent view of Table Mountain. The sky is blue. The sun is shining. It's about 30 degrees um, hot outside. Well, it was 30 degrees today. And uh, we've just been doing the the tourist thing in Cape Town. We actually went on one of the little red double-decker buses and went to like one, you know, all the way along with the Rhine route and just seeing some of the historical places to go to. And uh, it's a very special place at uh, Cape Town. Mm, that sounds beautiful. It really does. You'll have to send me a picture after we get off the phone today and I'll share it with our audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <clears throat> yes. So I am so fascinated with what you do. So you combine adventure and travel and then making a difference, um, really doing good for the world. Tell us a little bit about how you got started leading these amazing trips that you lead. 
Um, well, I've also um, I've always had such a, a deep love for Africa, and I've always been passionate about travel and wildlife. And in 2012, a friend and I went on a, a, a rally. It was called the Foot Foot Rally. And it basically just opened up um, Africa, well, adventure travel into Africa. And it showcased us. We were two women traveling on our own. And it showed us that it was safe for us to be out there. And, um, yeah, I also started at the right, about the same time as in 2012, I started my organization called the Blue Sky Society Trust. And it was also around that time that I started hearing about uh, the poaching crisis that is currently happening in Africa. And, I mean, the stats are very, I mean, they're shocking. I mean, we're losing up to two game rangers a week, um, two to three rhinos a day, um, 98 elephants, which is one elephant every 15 minutes. Wow. And, um, yeah, I know. When I heard those, those stats, I was completely shocked and horrified and, I don't know, I just decided that I couldn't sit back and do nothing about it. So I've always wanted to travel up to Kenya and um, travel more in Africa. And when I heard about what was happening to our elephants, I kind of started talking to people about this expedition that I wanted to do. And, you know, they say once you start talking to people, you've actually got to go out there and do it. <laughs> right. It puts more pressure on you to go out there and make sure that it happens. And, um, yeah, fast forward a couple of years. Um, and, yeah, 2016, I, I headed out on my first expedition. So, yeah, so just a, a combination of adventure, travel, passion for Africa, and just wanting to do a little bit more, a little bit, you know, give back and just try and make a difference in and my own capacity. And did you say that you're losing two game rangers per week? Yeah, so it's two game rangers a week. And, and this is on average over the last couple of years. Okay. I mean, so it's a humanitarian crisis as well as a, as a conservation crisis. And, and, and the number of, of elephants again? Say that again. It's 98 elephants a day. Wow. Um, so it's about one wow. every 15 minutes. I mean, the, the poaching stats with the rhinos, I mean, it has gone down a little bit this year, but um, the actual occurrences of people trying to get into perch um, is still right up there, but they've obviously got more boots on the ground and anti-poaching units and things like that protecting the, the wild duck. So I think, I think also the, 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 the numbers of the animals have become less. I mean, our rhino population has dropped drastically. And I mean, if you work out 98 elephants a day, that's 36,000 elephants in the year. And, wow. um, yeah, they say that if these stats carry on, that there's a chance that, you know, our children and grandchildren won't get to see, to see rhinos and, and, and wildlife in the wild anymore. So, yeah, I just decided that I, I couldn't, you know. You sit couldn't back. sit back I, anymore. I had to try. I had to right. try and do something. Whatever it was, I had to try. So, yes. yeah, that, that got me on the road, and I haven't stopped since then. Well, that's the, I love this. I totally yeah. love this, and it's it's like really following that. My gosh, I can make a difference with this. And so, talk a little bit about the impact that you've made over the t the course that you've been doing these these trips. Okay, so uh, my first expedition that we did was in 2016. It was called the Elephant Ignite Expedition, and it was an all female expedition. So I had. 13 crew members. Um, five of them were permanent crew members. So we did a, a journey of, we drove just under 16,000 kilometers. I'm not sure what that is in miles, but um, a lot. <laughs> yeah, a lot. <laughs> it was over a hundred day period. And we, wow. Africa, yeah, we drove through 10 African countries. So we started in South Africa and we kind of like wound our way um, and finished off in, in Kenya and um, stopping to see different conservation groups, trying to focus, keeping with the female theme uh, on, on meeting up with women in conservation. Obviously, we met some incredible men out there as well. Right. But um, so we, uh, yeah, we visited some canine units, uh, the, the dog units and the anti-poaching teams. And, I mean, they are the actual heroes and heroes and sheroes, as I call them. Um, they're the ones that put their lines lives on the line every single day they're out there you know protecting our wildlife and so that was the the, the first expedition then in last year um 2018 i led my second all-female expedition called the rise of the matriarch and that was also an only female only crew and for that one we drove just under 12,000 kilometers in 50 days 
three, wow. four southern southern African countries. Yeah, so covered a lot of uh, kilometers in, through Africa, but um, yeah, it's been well worth it. And the incredible thing about these expeditions is that uh, you know you're getting ladies from all over the world that come. I mean, Tommy came for two weeks, and um, there are four main pillars when I, you know, when I do these expeditions. We've obviously got the conservation um, awareness side of it. So then there's a, a youth um, educational side of it where we've handed out to date over 50,000 educational booklets to children and communities which are adjacent to these wildlife areas. Mm -hmm. And it's so important for us to, to get into the hearts and minds of these children that are living in these areas because... You know, we have to reconnect them with nature. Somewhere along the line, we've kind of lost that, that connection. So there's a huge um, educational drive to it. We've also, um, we helped the first expedition, we helped set up two beekeepers in Savo, which is in Kenya, um, Josiah and Felicia. Felicia was the first female beekeeper. So there's a, an incredible project up in Kenya called Elephants and Bees. There's oh, interesting. A, yeah, there's an amazing lady called Dr. Lucy King, and she's discovered that elephants are petrified of bees, especially the African killer bee. And um, so what they're doing is to stop the, the human-wildlife conflict where, whereby you've got animals in wildlife areas and you've got, obviously, because the human population's exploding, they've left competing for land and food and water. So you, where you've got humans and animals next to each other, you often, often have conflict. And um, she's discovered that they don't like bees. So they put these bee hives um, around their crops as like a protection. As a, and um, there's a, a wire in between each beehive. And if the elephants are feeding and they bump the, the beehive, it causes the beehive to swing. And then before you know it, the bees come out in full attack mode. And the whole herd within a couple of seconds has moved off because they don't want to get stung by the bees. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, so that's very interesting. So we helped set up uh, two beekeepers there. Um, we also installed a water pump in a village called Mdaka Village, which is in Malawi, uh, just outside Kasumba National Park. And once again, we had these villagers, the ladies from the village, because they often have to go and collect the water, having to walk into the, the only water system there, with, which was in the national park. And... Um, they were often coming across elephants and then something would happen and then your villages or your community would retaliate because the, the elephants had either killed a member, a person, or, you know, scared them. And um, so we helped to install a, a water pump in their village. And um, it's the most incredible story because they, they're running a very successful permaculture project there. And they're now growing oyster mushrooms and you know, making a living from it. And just the simple gesture of, of our expedition installing a water pump that saved like over 3,000, well, it's changed over 3,000 people's lives, wow. which is pretty awesome, yeah. Right. And then, yeah, I mean, we've, we've collared elephants. Um, we've collared uh, an incredible little cow in a, called Ignite. They named it after the, the Elephant Ignite expedition. And then uh, more recently, I... Uh, uh, we raised some money to, to collar uh, another elephant called Matumbu, and um, that was with uh, Dr. Michelle Henley with Elephants Alive in South Africa. So there's a lot of little places along the way that we've helped support them. Um, and what does the collaring do for, for the... So, so the collaring is basically a way of them monitoring the elephants to study of their behavior, mm -hmm. because um, to see why they're going or where they're going. Um, yep. Obviously, over years, they, they've been going on the little elephant uh, migration paths. But it's also a form of um, being able to track them because when you can see when they're heading towards the villages and um, they can send out like a response unit to try and either warn the villages that the elephants are coming near. Okay. And, or they can obviously send like an anti-perching unit to try and Heard, for lack of better words, because they, you know, with the, they've got like little crackers that they let off to try and, you know, make them go back to to one of the, you know, the, the safety of the wildlife areas. Um, yeah, so it's it's, it's, it's it's quite a a lot of things that the collar does do, but I um, mean, it's very important, as I say, for research, for security, for 
you know, just watching them. Um, yeah, so but it's, they, they're quite expensive. They're like about 60,000 Rand. I think it's about $4,000, I think it is. But okay. um, they run off on like, satellite tracking devices so they can monitor them and see how they work and where their, their patterns are and where they're going. I mean, Ignite was was one of the cases that they were trying to figure out because there's a mine right next to where she lives. And um, they couldn't understand, obviously, with the mine, you've got like, all the big trucks and people and everything. And um, the elephants kept on breaking into the mine because they were obviously looking off. They were looking for some kind of mineral in the sand and in, oh, in the water. Yeah, mm-hmm. so it was... So they were trying to determine, you know, why these elephants kept on going somewhere where it was loud and noisy and where there were people and it was dangerous. So by by collaring her or us raising money to to help collar her, they'd be able to carry on with their research. So yeah, so it's that's very, interesting. So tell yeah, me yeah. about tell me about your personal connection to elephant. I mean, what when, when you I mean, uh, literally I putting that. your hand on your heart and thinking about the elephant of Africa, what yeah, comes up for it, you personally? Do you know why I love them so much? They they just they just seem to embody everything that's good about Africa and family. Um, they're incredibly wise, the the elephants. I mean, mm-hmm. you always, they're very intelligent. Right, I heard that. Uh, yeah, they, like you know, you always hear like an elephant sort of ele- memory of an elephant, an elephant never forgets all those like sayings. And um, the thing why why I chose elephants for my first expedition because it was a all female journey. And uh, the the matriarch in a herd is is a female, and she mm-hmm. leads the herd. And um, I don't know, there just there's so many things that we as a species can learn from from elephants mm-hmm. and from the matriarch. And she leads a herd with great strength and confidence, but um, she with like sometimes also with a bit of a, a gentle hand. And mm-hmm. um, they they're such compassionate and empathetic animals. I mean, if you see the relationship between a mother and her baby. The sisters, I mean, the mother will touch her baby. Um, I think it's every two to three minutes. So there's an incredible connection. Mm. That's why um, the, if an elephant gets orphaned through coaching or through human wildlife conflict, um, the baby often doesn't survive because it right. dies of a broken heart. And um, another thing that I love about the, the matriarch is that she always relies on her network of sisters. So you've got the aunts, you've got the older siblings, and they work together as a unit. So that's something that inspires me and makes me, well, think that we as humans, we should, you know, we could do more of that, working mm. together and supporting each other. And I don't know, it's a, they're just incredible animals. And, um, um, it's making me smile as you just, <laughs> and it's, and I think it's, you know, what we need more of in our world right now. It's that, that passionate yeah. leadership. And as you have chosen to lead so many female expeditions, what was the calling to that? Um, I think it's just because it was something different. And it was, once again, just to showcase that, you know, people have got this bigger, you know, idea that Africa is so scary. And right. if you're a female on your own, you can't go travel on your own. And, you know, and I think the world's changing so much. That's why I called my, my second expedition, The Rise of the Matriarch, because everywhere around the world, different cultures, just different women from different ages, different walks of background, they just kind of seem to be standing up for, for for themselves. And it just like it inspired me to to lead this group of women. I mean, um, and I just believe that there's there's something very powerful when you get a, a group of women together. Um oh, absolutely. The same common passion. Right. And um, yeah, so just to it was new something new as well. I mean there've been incredible couples that have done amazing things. There've been incredible men that have gone out there and done stuff. There have been incredible women that have gone up and done stuff around the world. But I think it was just something new. And I think right. Africa is very ready for women. Um, I mean, they call Africa Mama Africa. So mm. it's, uh, it's, I don't know, it was just a little, little bit of everything that kind of made sense to me at the time. <laughs> why, why do they call it Mama Africa? I don't know. Hey? It's, it's like the mother city in Cape Town. Mm. It's just like she's nurturing, I don't know, she's... That's really fascinating to me. Yeah, it is fascinating, eh? Yeah, really totally, <laughs> totally. Well, I love that, and I and I think that um, that you know that you've listened to that. And what is it like for women to travel 
on their own throughout Africa or together in Africa? I mean, what's, what's different, what's unique about, and it, part of that is like me, making me want to even, if, if it's called mother Africa, right. Yeah. It's, and it's like, it's, there's this connection to something that's really powerful. Um, yeah. talk to, talk to me a little bit about that. Um, so, I mean, I've done since 2012, I've done quite a lot of traveling in Africa and you see more and more of, I mean, with this last expedition, we bumped into two ladies. I mean, the one lady was in her 70s, and she had, uh, I think she was a German lady, and she had been traveling on her own for two years in this old Toyota car. And we were all like, wow, you know? And you see more and more of that. And obviously, Africa has got its problems. It's good, it's bad, but it's never dull. Um, you've got to be aware of things, and, um, you know, from a security point of view, do your homework. Um, don't just go in there blind. Be very right. mindful. Mm-hmm. But um, the more and more time I spend up there, the more and more there's a there's a thing that um, they always used to talk with, with Nelson Mandela, and they said it's the spirit of Ubuntu, which is like a get-togetherness. And um, I always say to people that there's an incredible kindness with people out there. I mean, obviously you get your good and your bad everywhere around the world. Right. But um, the people out, out in Africa, they can't, eh? Um, there's a lot of poverty there, and I think they do appreciate tourists coming through. But, um, I mean, we've touched wood, never had any, you know, hassles or anything like that. Um, people have just been more than accommodating and generous and kind and supportive. Um, as I say, do your homework, um, right. know where you're going, and, right. and it, it's possible. I mean, and it's becoming more and more accessible to, to ladies. And, um, yeah. <laughs> so, so tell us um, a little bit about the women you encounter who, you know, who live there, who live on the land. What is their life like? Um, you know, I, I, you know, I appreciate the fact that, you know, you brought water into a, a village and tell us a little bit about the lives of the women that you are encountering on your trip. Yeah. Uh, I just find them incredibly brave and inspirational. I mean, I've met some of the most phenomenal women that are out there, sometimes in the most, they're just so selfless. And, I mean, life out there, it's not easy. It's tough. I mean, right. you sometimes have got logistical challenges. You've got, uh, they're dealing with, with problems like human-wildlife conflict where they've got, you know, elephants doing raiding crops. And so you've got your villagers that are angry. Uh, they've got the poaching crisis that is, that is happening at the moment. Um, you've got logistical challenges. Sometimes the elephants will come through and they'll break all the water pipes, so you might not have water for days. Mm-hmm. And um, funding, that's another one. Um, you know, funding's always a problem to these projects. They, they cost lots of money. Mm-hmm. Um, the anti poaching units, the canine units to protect the animals, they all fall, you know, lots of, uh, well, there's lots of, you know, money behind those. You've got your staff issues. I think that's worldwide. Um, and then also gender discrimination. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's The conservation area has predominantly been a very male-dominated era you know, over the past years. I mean, it's more and more now you're seeing more and more women coming through, um, and it's, it's wonderful to see. But like 10, 20 years ago, it was mostly 99.9% you no know, men. And... Um, so, I mean, some of the ladies that we met at the Charity Angels, it's, a, it's the first female guiding team, and they are based in Botswana on the Chobe River. And we met some of the ladies, and they've been guiding for a couple of years. And um, the guy that actually started this, uh, the Chobe Angels, um, because the females would go through the guiding courses in Botswana, and then nobody would employ them afterwards because females were seen as being weaker than men physically, mm-hmm. um, you know, because like when you're driving through thick sand or you're changing tires or something. But the guy was saying to us that that's why he employed all these, all these women, because he said women are, are just incredible. When they set their mind to something, they do it. He said that it might take them longer than men, but they're not as cowboyish um, as men. And he said the maintenance of their vehicles has has gone down a lot because they're more cautious with their driving and they don't want to, you know, have to change tires and, and, you know, get stuck in the sand. But, I mean, these ladies that we met, they were saying that, uh, I mean, they had, I mean, one or two of them had been physically assaulted in the park Mm -hmm. because the men 
the men didn't think that they should be there or that they didn't deserve to be there. And this is like a couple of years ago. It's like recent. Right. And I mean, that is challenging. And these women just stick their heels in and, and just carry on. And They're courageous. Just, so they are so courageous and so brave. And I mean, a lot of them, when they said that they started working in Africa, I mean, they were told by their families and, you know, what do you think you're doing and you're mad and, you know, it's, it's tough out there and it's not easy and it's emotionally draining and physically challenging. And they just, as I say, just believed that that was their inner calling and they put their heads down and, I mean, it's, you know, not easy, you can imagine, but they, they've done it. Eh? And they are so, I mean, the number of women that I've met out there, they are so brave and I just think they're unsung heroes. They really are. Mm. <laughs> they impress me all the time. <laughs> That's why I want to tell these stories. Right. Because I believe that the world needs to know what these women are going through and what they've done and what they've achieved and, you know, some of their success stories and support them. I mean, right. a lot of the, like in South Africa, you've got the, the Black Mambas. I mean, I spoke about the Chobi Angels, um, but in South Africa, you've got the Black Mambas, which is the first anti-poaching female unit. And they all, like, when you hear about it, I and mean, then you sat and chatted to them, and some of them are mothers, some of them are sisters, they aunts. So they out there every single day, putting their lives on the line, uh, protecting our wildlife, and then they've got to go home, and they've got to be a mom, they've got to be a, a a wife, or a you know, and it's it's like things like that. These women, and they've got to get up early in the morning to make sure that they feed their children before they can, you know, come to work and 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 uh, you know and try and protect our animals. And they're they're, they're brave ladies, eh? mm. and um, yeah, that's <laughs> and awesome. Miami. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how has leading these trips changed your life? <laughs> it's, it's made me realize so many things. It's made me realize that if you dream and believe in something and you're passionate about it, you can do it. Even if every single person in the world thinks you're mad. Or crazy, <laughs> you <laughs> what know? did you do beforehand? What did you do before uh, you started these? I was actually at a, it was quite funny, I was in an auctioneering company. I've done I've done commercial property. I've had my own event coordinating company. Uh, I was in marketing and PR, uh-huh. but I always felt that there was something missing in my heart. Eh? Mm-hmm. And I always felt that I wanted to do more. And uh, just going on, I mean, I just I said to some of my best friends in that the other day. I said, like, when I was out there on the last expedition, I just feel so calm inside it, so full, mm. and I just love being out there and. And just also meeting these these incredible women from from all different walks of life. Right. And you get, I mean, the my youngest has been eighteen, and then my oldest has been seventy two. And they're women from all over the world. You're meeting these incredible women from all over the world. Everyone's got their own story. Everyone's got their own challenges and success stories. But they've all just connected with this common passion, mm-hmm. and it's so powerful. I mean, when you get a group of women together with the same beliefs and interests and everything, it's, it's, un- we're unstoppable. <laughs> it's totally it's unstoppable. And it's, yeah. And, and I love that you took this big leap from, you know, doing something very normal in life and going, you know what, I'm going to do something entirely different. And even despite the fact that people were telling you, you're, you're mad, you're, yeah. crazy. Um, <laughs> and what and was that, it, what was that inner peace that kept, you saying, you know what, I'm doing this no matter what all these other people are telling you? I think it's just knowing that, you know, we're never going to fix the world and we're never going to save all the elephants. I think it's just knowing and realizing that every single one of us out there in the world can make a difference. Yes. I mean, sometimes people, they they get unrealistic with the, you know, they want to, you know, we're going to save all the whales or we're going to say, but, you know, when you realize that if you, you know, with the poaching crisis at the moment, we're never going to stop the poaching crisis. But if we can bring down the numbers and protect the animals as much as we can, then we're doing something. I mean, I was chatting to somebody the other day and they, they went on a, they, they wanted to get involved in, in, in an ocean cleanup because of what's happening in our oceans. And she turned around to them and she was like, well, there's so many things that you as individuals can do starting from home. Because sometimes people, you know, put this pressure on themselves to go out there and do so much and then it becomes overwhelming and then they give up or they get disappointed and then they give up, you know. But if you if you break it down and you do small little things every single day and you encourage your children or your family 
or whatever it is to do each person to do a small little thing every day. I mean, right. if you add that all up before you know it, you, you're all doing something big. And, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's quite interesting. I mean, it's not easy, um, right. quite emotional and physically challenging and all that fun stuff. But I'm very persistent. I'm very determined. And yeah. um, I've got a very good support network. And I always surround myself with some of the most incredible men and women, um, people like Tommy and yes. you know, obviously yourself and things like that. And uh, like I say, when you've got a group of women, women working together for the same cause, we, nobody can stop us. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. What, what would you tell someone who's, you know, got a big idea, a big dream? And there's, you know, something, you know, it, it could be around conservation. It might be around yeah. travel. It might be around, you know, whatever. It might be around, you know, the, the, the plastic in the ocean, whatever that looks like. What would you say to them? Um, I would say to them that always follow your dreams. Mm-hmm. Um, push yourself outside your, your comfort zone because often, you know, if you, we, we're so scared of, of achieving greatness or of failure that we stop ourselves from doing things and, I firmly believe that if you're passionate about something and uh, that uh, that you believe you can do something and and it's you're doing it for the right reasons. I always ask myself, you know, when I start a project, it was like, Carla, why are you doing this project? Is it for mm. ego? Is it for fame? Is it for whatever? And if the answer is yes to any of those and it doesn't agree with what I'm trying to do, then I won't do it. But if it's to do, you know, to inspire women or people or children to go out there and make a difference, then I'll do it. Um, also, just to for people, people don't realize how strong we are. Um, like when we talk about these women out there that have done such amazing work, I mean, they are such. You don't realize how strong you are until you put yourself in a situation that that's not good. Mm. And we just somehow have got this resilience, or you know, we can adapt. And uh, I love that. And it's yeah. I, I was I, my my interview that I did just prior to this um, was with a, a, a woman named Arzu Zarafshan and she grew up in Iran during the Iraq, Iran, Iraq war. Yeah. And she, that's exactly what she said. She said, it's, you know, you don't know how strong you are until you live through some really brutal situations. Right. Yeah. And that, that when you, when you move through that, it's like, that's, that's where our strength really comes up. It's like, it's like the warrior in us. Arises. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's always, it's, it's so fascinating to me because like often you meet people on these expeditions and you think, oh, she's going to be a very strong crew member. And then you'll have somebody that's very quiet or something. And then somewhere along the line, you know, Africa it teaches you to take on dark little challenges with a bit of a sense of humor. And somewhere along the line, something will happen. And these, sometimes these women that you don't expect to, that will be so strong, they come through and they are so strong. So I say to people, whatever you believe in, as long as you're doing it for the right reason, just do it. No matter what, you know, what circumstances say, what your financial situation says, what your family says, you know, if, if you believe in something, just put yourself outside your comfort zone and just don't be, we'll a, go for don't it. be afraid to achieve greatness. Right, right. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So what gives you hope, Carla? Oh, there's so many things that give me hope, but I think that... Just seeing the re- resiliency in the earth, um, in nature, mm. in people. Yes. Um, you know, we the ones that have made so many mistakes and we the ones that have created all these problems, but then we also the ones that can try and fix them. And I think once people know that, then that gives me hope. Um, also, when you get people from all different walks of life, you know, you might have somebody that's a student or somebody that's a doctor. Uh, from a different country around the world, when you've got one purpose, you know, one common purpose or goal and you work together, that, that gives me help. I mean, gives yeah. me hope. And um, also just seeing these ladies on the expedition, they, they, they start off as one person and when they leave, they, they basically, I mean, for lack of better words, they have these life-changing experiences and they yeah. leave so powerful. And right. so, yeah, I mean, I've had uh, friends of mine that are, are now living in, Kenya and Tanzania, they've just gone on these different life-changing paths. And it's, it's that, that kind of stuff, you know, that gives me hope. There's, there's a lot, lot out there that's still worth fighting for. And, and I believe there are incredible people that are doing amazing stuff. And just seeing that and 
being able to connect them and work with them, that, that gives me a lot of hope. So Carla, tell us a little bit about the expedition experience. What's it like? I know you've got expeditions coming up. What if somebody is, is, is listening to this and saying, Oh my gosh, this sounds amazing. What would a, you know, a week or two weeks or three weeks look like coming to join you on that? So my expeditions are very, um, people, uh, everyone does their, they're very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, people get involved. Mm-hmm. So um, it's not like a glamping expedition. No, no I heard that. Everyone, it, it, there's like there quite a lot of challenges. I mean, obviously, like firstly, you've got your physical challenges. We do, we drive, sometimes we drive through water crossings and sand driving and four by fouring. Um, you know, you've got your physical challenges. Like if we, if we get a flat tire, we have to change it. Yeah. <laughs> um, that fun stuff is often lots long days of uh, long hours of driving um, on corrugated roads and dust. Um, but then on, on, on the other hand, then you've got these, we do a lot of camping. Um, mm-hmm. Every now and then, every second to third day, I do try and book the ladies or, or the people into like a chalet or a room just so that they can have a good night's sleep. Because often when you're camping, you know, you've got these incredible sounds around you that you don't, you know, sleep too deep. <laughs> I bet not. Like Tommy, Tommy will tell you, I mean, the one night we were, we were camping in, in Tule Block and I woke up at uh, one o'clock in the morning and I, you know, when you've just got that feeling that, that something's there. Right, right. <laughs> you know what your mind can do at one o'clock in the morning before you know it, you've got like lions and elephants and everything. And Tommy had actually woken up and, and she needed to go to the loo. And uh, she'd she told me this story. <laughs> but go ahead, go on. And she was happily walking around the camp at one o'clock in the morning, and I woke up and I just had a feeling something was there. And the next day, the guard came down, and he—I mean, my tent was quite a little bit further away than than all the other where the other ladies were. And uh, he's like, "Oh, look here, lion prince." I was like, "Oh my word!" <laughs> there was a lion that had been obviously cruising around. So it is you out there in nature, but. Um, you know, we've uh, yeah, through a few years of, of experience, you kind of tell people what you can and can't do. Um, people do get involved, so we get involved. In each each one of us one day will do cooking or cleaning. Um, if you want to drive, you can get involved in the driving. Um, otherwise, you if you're quite happy just to be a passenger, then that's also not a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, setting up camp, breaking down camp. Uh, then you've got things like but you've got things of like sitting around the campfire and telling stories. You've got hours on the road listening to 80s music or 70s music or whatever you've got to touch on. And, you know, you get a bit of banter over the radio because you're talking to each other and sometimes the roads are very long and straight. And, you yeah, you just create this incredible bond with people, hey. Um, just also in Africa, it, it teaches you how to be more uh, compassionate towards your fellow travelers uh, because right. you – in a car for 24 hours, well, not 24 hours, but for 10 hours of the day or whatever it is. Sometimes it's that, sometimes it's less. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's not for everyone, right. but for those people that are wanting to go out there and really get their hands, you know, hands-on experience. Uh, but then also, on the other hand, then we get to meet some of the most incredible conservationists. We get to, to go to the rural schools and meet the children and see some of the community projects. You know, get involved. And like the, uh, our next expedition in May, we're going to go collar elephants up in Mozambique. Mm-hmm. And uh, we obviously the animals' uh, safety is always a huge priority. And but we work with these professionals, and if they see that you're enthusiastic and you're willing to get involved, they sometimes allow one or two of the crew members to take like the DNA samples, or or to um, uh, I was allowed to uh, administer the anti. It's an anti where they wax the elephant up, yeah. So that was quite an honour. So there, yes. there are lots of incredible experiences that uh, that you know on these expeditions that we get to do. And um, I mean, there's also quite a lot of emotional challenges. Um, obviously, you're meeting these people, you're hearing these stories, you're hearing about some of their challenges, but you're also hearing a lot about their successes. Right. And um, Like in 2016, we got to meet Sudan. He was the last male northern white rhino in the world. And, you know, it was was an incredible honour to meet meet this rhino. And um, he sadly passed away last year. 
um, which means that the, the species is extinct. Okay. And um, I can't even try and explain to you what it's like when you when you're looking extinction in the eyes. I mean, right. we all felt exceptionally emotional, and we were just <sighs> disappointed and embarrassed as that we as human as a human species could have allowed this to happen. But it also made us, you know, it also motivated us and made us more determined that, you know, we need to work together, we need to make changes, we need to speak out for the animals, you know, we need to, to support each other. Um, so there's, you know, swings and roundabouts. <laughs> right, so, yeah. right. And it yeah. feels like it's a deep, deep connection to the land, to the wildlife, yeah. to the people, to the villages. I mean, it's like, it's, it's such a, an experiential way to, to move through Africa yes. um, in a way that is connected. Yeah. And also, I mean, somewhere along the line as, as, as humans, we've become so disconnected with nature. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely, we, agree. We're living in a, a society that's completely obsessed with infrastructure and it's ruled by egos and greed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've just forgotten how to live side by side with each other in harmony. And, you know, we've got so many experiences, you know, that, that challenge us daily. You know, there's war, there's terrorism, there's racism, there's increased living expenses, there's the pressures of being successful or there's the pressures of how many people have you got following you on Instagram and are they liking what you post? You know, there's so many, you know, um, superficial uh, things, right? Yeah. Superficial things. And what I found with these, these, um, these expeditions, it kind of, it makes you really just rethink your life and Mm. just really appreciate, it humbles you for lack of better words. It, It really opens your eyes and, I mean, a lot of the girls, they, they've got these preconceived ideas about poaching and about communities and about fences. And when they actually get to meet the people on the ground, it's like you, you can see the, 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 the changes in their, in their ways of thinking. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually it's very powerful to see that. Uh, and, um, yeah, sounds just amazing. Them, yeah, just connecting them with nature again and just appreciating what's around them. And also learning how to slow down. Right. I mean, we kind of constantly on this hamster wheel. We'd be running from A to B, you know, doing this. And I mean, I drive a little 1997 Land Rover Defender, and I, people always say to me, "Why do you drive it?" Um, she's old. She's 22, and I just said because she teaches me how to slow down. She can't go more than 90 kilometers an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got to plan ahead. You know, if you you've got to drive somewhere that's going to take you an hour. Her name's Dora, Dora the, Dora the Explorer. Name oh, that's Dora. awesome. Dora the Defender. And you've actually got a plan, you know, and people go whizzing past you because they've got, and they get so angry. And with her, I just sit back and I open up my window, I turn my music on, and you just slow down and you just start looking at things around you and appreciating, you know, yeah. what's, what's happening. <laughs> that's awesome. That's totally awesome. And so where, <laughs> um, and you do have some trips coming up. Yes, I do. I've got uh, in May, we're going to go and collar elephants up in a place called Gilet or Gili uh, National Reserve, which is up in uh, mid northern Mozambique. Um, so it's going to be a, a two week. Uh, mostly, uh, I found with my expeditions that people can, can normally come for about two weeks, 10 days to two weeks. Uh-huh. And um, yeah, we're going to be going to go and collar five elephants up there, which is going to be an incredible experience. We're also going to be handing out more educational booklets to the, the schools that are adjacent to these uh, wildlife areas. And um, I'm trying to bring on a new project um, whereby we are wanting to hand out cloth or um, sanitary towels for girls to try and keep them at school. Because often where they have, you know, their periods and that they, they've got nothing, so they don't go to school. And we all know that education is such an important thing. And obviously, because of my love of the environment, I don't want to bring in more plastic or anything like that. Right. So there are organizations that are making these cloth uh, sanitary pads and the girls can, you know, reuse them and wash them. And, uh-huh. so that, and I want to try and start doing more of that project. So that's the one expedition. And then um, I'm also going to be um, working with an incredible organization called African Parks. They, I always say they should rule the world. They've got the most incredible template where they do education. They've got strong anti-poaching teams. Um, they've got uh, community projects that they're working with. So everything like, goes hand in hand. And that's going to probably be in 
August, September. So we're going to try and get to a place called Lewa Plains, which is in Western Zambia. Um, and then there's another one that I'm trying to, well, I'm putting together, which is called, a, it's a wetlands place called Benguela, which is in Northern Zambia. And then there's going to be another one going to Malawi and, uh, you know what I mean? What's a, the more I can be out there, <laughs> the happier I am. So there are going to be lots of, of these little two-week um, expeditions where people can actually feel like they, they're doing something. I call them journeys with purpose. Um, they're fundraising expeditions. So a portion of what I charge people goes towards the fundraising element, whereby we will go and visit the conservation groups, we'll see the projects, and then we'll, we'll donate money towards their projects. Um, so, yeah, so I'm encouraging all your listeners out there to, if they're interested, they're not scared to get involved, hands on, they're not scared of a bit of camping and dust, then, um, <laughs> it, they, but they are life changing. They really right. are. It sounds yeah. like it. It sounds like amazing. I would love it's to fun. be there at some point. <laughs> totally. Yeah. 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 And, and from a fundraising perspective, is there a ways that people could contribute to your fundraising, um, from afar? Yeah, so I'm busy just be busy re- revamping my website and updating it at the moment. But what I'm going to be doing is for each specific um, expedition, there's a chosen beneficiary. So people will be able to go and see why are we going there, why are we doing what we are, because people need to know. I mean, there's a lot of donor fatigue at the moment because, you know, there's so many organizations out there asking for our help. And um, so it's very important to people know why we're doing what we do. Mm-hmm. And so there will be like a, just a little explanation, explanatory um, thing about who who we're going to go and support, who we're raising money for, and why we're raising money for them. So yeah, so people, your your listeners will be able to go on there and and you know. What is your website? It's a, a blue. It's www. Bluesky. dot org. Okay. okay. Yeah, and, and then and also I've got I've got social media. We've got uh, at Blue Sky, um Society, which is. Um, uh, on Instagram and Facebook. Okay. And and we'll yeah. put both of those links, all three of those links on the so show notes for that. So, <laughs> yeah. so anyone people... just want, yeah, I'll just tell people if they want to get hold of, you know, hold because sometimes they need to plan ahead, they need to save money or they can't come at a specific time period. They must just keep in comms with me. Um, and then whenever I've got something new coming up, I mean, now that I've partnered with well, I'm busy in the process of, you know, working with African parks and that, they've got the most amazing projects around Africa. And so I'll be trying to make specific fundraising expeditions for to help and support their projects and also get a little bit of tourism into some of the parks that they've got. Right. So, yeah. Right. Very cool. Very cool. <clears throat> so, Carla, the final question we always close with is, what three pearls of wisdom can you leave with our audience today? My biggest one is don't, we've spoken about this, don't let anyone tell you that you can't do something. Mm. You know, if you've got the passion, you've got the drive, you've got the inspiration, you'll always find a way. And another one is just, no matter what your current life situation is at the moment, um, you know, that doesn't define you as a person. Your actions do. So I'm big in surrounding myself with like-minded, positive people. Um, Always stay humble. Always be kind. Um, push yourself outside your comfort zone and, you know, obviously don't be afraid to achieve greatness. And then my, my last thing I would try and say to other people is just support each other. You know, everybody's going through something. And, you know, as I say, we're all driven in the society of, of egos and greed and just, you know, just support each other and lift each other up because I firmly believe that if we all work together, that we're unstoppable. And it's just nice to, to be kind to other people. Absolutely. Well, Carla, this has been <laughs> such a pleasure. I really appreciate it. You are so inspiring to me. Oh, thank you. That's so sweet. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And <laughs> um, do what I can. Huh? <laughs> I, <laughs> absolutely. And I, I look forward to meeting you some days. One of these days, I'll come, come on one of my expeditions. Yes. Absolutely. Well, well, Tommy's Tommy's an avid birder, and when I tell her about the one up at Northern Benguela, there's a shoe ball stalk there. So apparently, it's a very unique bird. So yeah, we'll, we'll get you both on an expedition too. Oh, that would be awesome. That'd be so much okay. fun. Well, thank you, Carla. You have a great day. Thank you, Cammy, and thank you very much to Yeah for including me in your in your your radio in the show. Well, I really appreciate the support. Thank you so much. Uh huh. Bye. Bye. 
I hope you liked this episode of Extraordinary Women Radio. If you did, please share this podcast with your own special tribe of women and help spread the love, the dreams, and the inspiration. Are you ready to raise up your voice, your visibility, and your business? I invite you to visit me at CammieGelner.com to find out how you can make heartfelt connections to mindful strategies to ignite an abundant flow of cash and clients into your business. I'd love to hear from you on any of my social media channels. I'm on both Facebook and Twitter. Till next time, my friend, listen to your heart, follow your dreams, and be you.